Hello, and welcome to this latest webcast of the Community Knowledge Network Education Series, brought to you by the Vizient Hospital Improvement Innovation Network. Today's program will continue our examination of an emerging and crucial issue, safe and effective pain relief and optimal opioid stewardship. It's in the news on a daily basis, calling opioids killer drugs, a crisis costing billions of dollars. Drug abuse is the leading cause of accidental deaths in the United States. And according to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, overprescribing and the diversion of opioids is the root of the problem. The CDD, CDC says 91 Americans die from opioid overdoses every day. Our program today features examples of healthcare organizations with strategies to battle this opioid crisis. We will bring you a multifaceted view of ways to address this crisis within your healthcare system. This is not a simple answer but we challenge you to consider what, you may, what may work in best in your setting after viewing today's program. Joining us on our panel today are Dr. David Ring from Dell Medical School at the University of Texas in Austin and Monica Morgan from Ochsner Health System in New Orleans. We also have video interviews with experts from Calvert Health and Intermountain Healthcare. I'm Dr. Robert Dean, Senior Vice President of Performance Management here at Vizient, and I'll be your moderator. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, let's start review our learning objectives for today. After viewing this program, you will be able to describe the difference between pain and noise susception and how this difference impacts pain management strategies, and outline an integrated delivery network's overall strategy to combat the opioid epidemic. And now let's meet our guest. First, Dr. David Ring. David, welcome to the program. Briefly tell us about your background and your contribution in this area. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, specialized in upper extremity surgery, and I'm associate dean for comprehensive care at the new Dell Medical School at the University of Texas in Austin. I'm also the chair of the patient safety committee at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and pain relief, safe and effective pain relief has long been a passion of mine. Great, thanks for being here. Also, Monica, welcome to the program. Please tell us about your background and your contributions to the work in this area. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Monica Morgan, I'm a pharmacist by trade, and in my current role at Oshner, I'm responsible for coordinating clinical programs for our health system, one of which is opioid stewardship. And I lead one of our work groups in the Opioid Stewardship Committee, which is an interdisciplinary team that focuses on efforts across the continuum of care from the community and ambulatory setting all the way to the acute care setting. So this problem, the root of it really starts with our efforts to alleviate pain in healthcare. David, can you expand on this a little bit and give us some background? Pain is an extremely common, normal part of human existence. As you get older, shoulder, thumb, knee, back, neck will all get arthritis or rotator cuff tendinopathy. Pain is the number one reason people seek care. And going back, we can look at the use of opioids over time. Uh, they've been around since the dawn of written history, uh, and there have been times at which misuse was an issue. So we think about after the Civil War, when uh, morphine was first used and there was a hypodermic needle uh, for the first time, there was something called soldier's disease after the war of soldiers that were uh, hooked on the morphine. And then morphine was part of many patent medicines, and many women got uh, a, a misuse uh, habit at the end of the last century. And then if we look at the, the way the pharmaceutical industry was involved in this, at every stage when they had a new medication, uh, it was initially marketed as the cure for the last one. So morphine was the cure for opioid uh, misuse and heroin was, would get you off morphine. And things got out of hand, and enough so that the government stepped in and there was a series of laws passed and with these laws, the culture changed and doctors started to be more careful with opioids and, uh, and limited it. And fast forward, up, that goes all the way up to the, to the uh, DEA in the 70s. And then in 1980 and then into the 90s, there was uh, a change. And we started to say, uh, there was a few advocates and uh, backed by the pharmaceutical industry and, and marketing that were saying, we undertreat pain and we overworry addiction. And uh, this led to uh, a marked increase in prescription of opioids. Uh, there were fourfold four -fold increase with a corresponding increase in prescriptions um, and misuse 
and overdoses and deaths. And now, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing the same. This has been mostly, this has been a uniquely United States and Canadian problem. Uh, it, this is where this change in culture and this marketing uh, really took effect. But now we're seeing the same thing happen in Europe. So let's build on that. Uh, what's the current approach to pain management in the U.S. and Canada? And how did opioids become such a centerpiece of that, that therapy? So based on this advocacy and marketing, we have come on upon an opioid-centric view of pain relief. Uh, so if we have a, if someone says, I'm not satisfied with my pain relief, this is really hurting me, we tend to think, I can give you a stronger opioid or more opioids. That's our first thought, and sometimes it's our only thought. It's also been a matter of convenience. I can remember as a resident, and I still see it to this day, uh, I don't want that phone call at night. I don't want that weekend phone call, that holiday phone call. So uh, give them a lot. And then we know that those unused pills that resulted were, part, were diverted, either stolen or, or misused or sold, and that was part of the opioid crisis. And if, when we look at people who are having more pain than we expect, or, uh, or, or for longer, having persistent pain when the body's healing is already pretty well established, uh, there is an emotional component to pain. And I think we may have been overlooking that, maybe misdiagnosing symptoms of depression or less effective coping strategies like catastrophic thinking, which is where you, we, we have a natural tendency to prepare for the worst. It's a, it's a good thing in many ways, particularly in pain, you kind of think the worst, but you can get stuck on it in a way that's not helpful. And I think maybe we've under-recognized, under-diagnosed, and under-treated that. And I think Dr. Rain and Dr. Ding, you both would agree we all go into healthcare to take care of our patients and to help our patients. And somewhere along the line, we forgot to have that conversation with them that surgery may hurt and we wanted to treat their pain level to zero, which may be an unrealistic goal. And so knowing that, that opioids are effective for the treatment of acute pain, we overutilized them and it became acceptable to minimize the risk that a patient would incur in taking these medications. It looks like the c approach to acute perioperative pain really needs to change if we're gonna address this problem. Yeah, I found it really helpful to distinguish nociception and pain. We, we think of, when we say pain, we think of tissue damage, we think of harm, we think of pathophysiology, worse arthritis. Um, so. Think about nociception, let me explain to you what nociception is. Nociception is the physiology of actual or potential tissue damage. So pinch the back of your hand and all of the biochemical things that happen when you do that and the receptor signals that arise then get carried by nerves up to your spinal cord and from the spinal cord to your brain. That physiological mechanism is nociception. Now pain is what you do with that nociception. Pain is the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that you have in reaction to the nociception. So if somebody else pinches me, and I have no control over it, and I don't know what's happening and when it's gonna stop, I'm going to have more pain. As we can look at athletes who expect pain in a game and they can have a broken ankle and finish the game. Uh, we can see injured soldiers carry another person off the, the battlefield. But then we have people with a lot of pain and we have no detectable nociception or pathology. There's many such diseases that we, and illnesses that we treat. And so keep in mind, when we see persistent pain or, or pain that is uh, more than expected, keep in mind that mind-body connection where emotions can create more pain for a given nociception. So your examples or your description uh, reminds me of a couple of things I've seen in the operating room. I remember one time we had a young rodeo rider who broke his femur and actually moved himself over from the cart to the operating room table with no assistance with a broken femur. And then we had uh, another person with a simple fracture of their ankle but required six people to help them move over to the operating room table because they were in so much pain. Do you think we're doing a good job recognizing the emotional component of pain? Well, your story really well, it brings it out expertly the different difference between nociception and pain. So we have the rodeo rider who's uh, probably been through a lot and say my femur's broken, it's gonna hurt, I'm gonna move over to this bed but it's gonna hurt. But it's part of getting better. You know, I gotta get, get over here to get that fixed and then my body needs time to heal. And then you have somebody with a, a relatively less minor, a, a, a less uh, severe injury, <clears throat> splinted, it's hard to splint a femur, and yet each pain that they feel 
or brings some you know, fear to mind. I won't be able to do this. I'll never be able to do that again. I'm causing more damage. I'm, uh, this is going to be a terrible experience. I don't know if it's going to be okay. And so the pain is greater. Now, what you're also describing is that we see it every day. We all see it every day. So we see the verbal and nonverbal signs of the emotional aspects of recovery, and yet we don't talk about them. And there's a stigma that creates a barrier. Uh, that we, we think our minds are perfect. We think that uh, we, uh, we can't make mistakes and we, that we're all invulnerable and, and perfect. So we have to understand that we are vulnerable and when you have pain and when you have problems, you're going to have emotions and thoughts that aren't always helpful. If you think about, um, you would expect, if somebody has knee arthritis, you would expect, if, I, if they say they have five out of 10 pain, you're gonna expect an X-ray that looks like five out of 10 arthritis, but it doesn't work that way. Some people can have very bad looking x-rays and very little pain. Sometimes people don't even know they have knee arthritis. And then you have people who come in for knee arthritis and they're, they have excruciating pain and they're very disabled and the x-ray looks pretty good. So this, the idea is that is everything that resiliency can do for you, everything that your inner healer and, and, and your body makes endorphins, but everything that support and meaning and purpose and drive and uh, and optimism and hope can do for relieving pain, we need to pay more attention to that. And I think that as we shift our thinking towards uh, away from just treating that singular aspect of pain to a more holistic approach, we have to include other disciplines and, and incorporate interdisciplinary teams and use our case management and nursing, social work and psych and pharmacy to really uh, help manage these patients in alternative pain treatment pathways. Yeah, it's, it's can be, it can be tricky to get people interested on uh, mindset coaching. You know, we, I think if you, if you wanted to learn how to play tennis, you'd get a tennis pro to teach you, or you want to go to learn how to learn, uh, lift weights or do yoga, you'd, you'd get a personal trainer. If you wanted to uh, have a better diet, you would get a diet coach. Why not a mindset coach? Uh, we're, not, we're not there yet, um, and, I'll, and trying to get make this sound appealing and sound like a great thing to do, it can be tricky. And, I, and my own personal journey is, I, I mean, I'm a surgeon, so I, I, uh, I, if you cut your finger off, I'll be there in the middle of the night to spend all night trying to put it back on. If the bone's sticking through the skin, I'm there. And it's probably, it should be no surprise and no shame that matter of fact, people like me that are willing, we have stress immunity and such, maybe our opportunity is to, to learn to be better communicators and be more compassionate and, and connect with people better. That certainly was my opportunity. I was, uh, I'm a blunt matter of fact goal oriented person and I would uh, try to give useful advice and transfer my expertise but, in, but without that genuine uh, connection. So I think we really need to, to I, it took me a long time to get good at surgery. It was hard and good communication skills are just as hard. I should put just as much effort into that. So it sounds like this is an additional skill set clinicians need. Should it be part of our training? Should it be part of medical school and residency, part of pharmacy school that we, we develop these skills? Yeah, I, I'm heartened by the fact that most medical schools have put a lot of thought into this and are really including it in their curricula. And for instance, at Dell Medical School, I find uh, there's a lot of attention to professionalism and compassion and, and effective communication strategies. The concern is, uh, uh, when they get out of, uh, another thing that's happening in medical schools is they, they get out into the clinical uh, area sooner. So they're, they're one year and then they're out in the clinical area. And our concern there is everything they've been taught, sort of best practices and they've been working on, then they go out and learn the habits of clinicians who are having these difficult conversations and just trying to survive the day. And, uh, and those habits, they may take on those habits, they're such a powerful force that shadow curriculum or that silent curriculum may undo a lot of the effective art of medicine training that they've had. So given the importance of this communication, I think it's important that we not only work on those communication skills, but also how do clinicians work better in team environments in order to do this? Because this is too much for just one clinician to do within a busy day. We really need that team approach. Yeah, I'd say you, if, if your surgeon is the person with the greatest opportunities in trying to be a good, effective communicator, you don't want to rely on them for effective communication. So I'm fortunate to have in my team at Dell Medical School and, and UT Health Austin a, a nurse practitioner who's very, uh, easy, does, is just very friendly, connects with people very easily, very empathetic and compassionate, Get, gets that visit off to a good start and makes a nice connection. And I have then a social worker, so if we find, if somebody says, yeah, 
mindset coaching is something that I could really benefit from. I'm having trouble controlling my thoughts. I've been down more than I'd like to lately, and then we can have her come in and help. It's been great. Dr. Ring, it sounds like you've built an effective team to better manage patients' pain. And I think it's important that we recognize that we all need to take a team approach involving different aspects and, and different disciplines, but also making the patient a part of their treatment, their treatment plan. Um, as we take on this more holistic approach to safe and effective pain relief, it's important to remember that the patient is at the center of that. They're the ones who feel the pain and who can um, better tell us where the pain is and, and how we can better treat them. So it, it involves a shared decision making among, a, again, an interdisciplinary team working together with the patient to effectively manage their pain. So how do we shift the discussion with both providers and patients to alternatives in terms of pain management? I, I suggest setting up uh, a strategy, an organization-wide strategy. So for surgeons, this is the way it would look. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. If I schedule a, a, a surgery, um, I go through a checklist, and the checklist has all the things that I need to be taken care of for the person to be medically safe, all the things that, to make the surgery happen, all the equipment I need. At the end of that checklist, I have a, a, something to remind me to discuss pain relief. And so I'll say something like, what did you take for your last procedure? And that starts a discussion that it, it makes two points out one question. First, it reminds people that surgery is going to hurt. Because I think sometimes we think things are so advanced that surgery is painless. And it also says, I care. I care about your pain. And I really want you to be as comfortable as possible. And sometimes you'll hear people say, yeah, well, I, I took 20, they gave me 20 Percocets for my knee arthroscopy, I took two. And then you can say, well, what did you do with the leftover pills? Because, you know, that's part of, you know, the opioid crisis that's going on, that's part of how it occurred, is that these pills sat unused in medicine cabinets and then were taken by a, an acquaintance or a friend or sold or given to a friend, and that's part of the problem. So you got to make sure you, know, you can get those to lock, locked boxes, safety boxes, deposit boxes at pharmacies, and uh, police stations, you can go on the FDA website to find the one nearest to you by putting in your zip code. Now, we also, again, part of this practice-wide strategy is to say, what is a reasonable amount, what's a maximum amount of opioids, both in the, the type and the number and the duration, to, for certain types of procedures? And you can uh, come to some agreement on that, and then it's collective, it's not individual. So it's not mean Dr. Ring, who's under treating your pain, it's how we keep people comfortable safely. And it's, it's an organizational wide thing that you can point to. We uh, also in the strategy emphasize and plan. You wanna have a plan. The more things feel planned, the more patients feel cared for. So you wanna have Tylenol uh, or acetaminophen, uh, nonsteroidals, ice and heat, elevation. You wanna be prepared to have friends around or funny movie or distract yourself. Get back involved in what you do. What makes you? Is it knitting that sweater? Is it uh, working? Do you love your work? Uh, is it playing music? And you want to, you can consider using uh, blocks and uh, indwelling catheters. And there's a lot of things that we can do beyond opioids uh, to try to help with pain relief. Another thing I can do with my patients now, we have electronic prescribing. Here in Texas, I can, uh, we can come to some agreement that we're going to try to limit the use of opioids and, and, and keep you comfortable as we can. And so I'll give maybe fewer opioids in my first prescription because I know that if we get into, if we say, yeah, more opioids might be good for you, I can always put more in electronically. I don't have to come into the office and get a paper script. Now as part of this, we also, as part of the strategy, we also want to screen for things that can get people more comfortable. So for instance, I can screen for symptoms of depression and I can screen for less effective coping strategies like catastrophic thinking. Now, if I identify that people have a good opportunity there, we can postpone the surgery and start working on that. And when they get their tank full they, and they're more prepared for surgery, they're going to have a more comfortable experience and a better recovery. We can also screen at the same time for risk factors for opioid misuse. And if that's a, an identified issue, we can also emphasize the need to be very, very careful with the opioids. It gets people thinking about the bad place they may end up and the care that they need to take with these medications. You can check the prescription monitoring program. You can, and this is getting easier and easier to do, you can see if the patient's getting opioids from other providers. You wanna make sure that it's coordinated, that each person's getting opioids from only one provider. 
If the person's on daily opioids, you gotta have a discussion with that person before you do the surgery. If they're taking, if they're on medication-assisted therapy for misuse disorder, or Suboxone or Methadone, you gotta have a discussion with that doctor. And you gotta make a plan. You gotta decide who's gonna handle what and how are you gonna do it. And finally, it, really the human part is the key part. So you've established a genuine caring relationship. Keep that relationship going. When the surgery's done, call them later that day. Call them later that morning. How are you doing? When the block's worn off, how are you doing? And those people who are having a lot of pain, see if you can reorient them and get them back to the set. You know, my body needs time to heal. It's, it, it's part of the healing process. See if you can get them back into that mindset. Let's talk about some of the national initiatives that are going on. David, you're heavily involved in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. What, what work is going on at the academy and that national level in order to help other orthopedic surgeons with effective pain management for their patients? So we're, we're, we're owning the part that we played in creating the crisis. We were some of the people giving out more opioids and probably was the right thing to do. And we, we want our patients comfortable. So we've developed a pain relief toolkit that's available on our website. It's, there's also an app that you can download. And it's got a lot of the tools that we've gone over right now. It, it, it actually it has even more. It has scripts for the type of pre-op discussion you might have and post-op discussions when people are having more pain than you would expect and they're, and they're not doing well. And you can also, uh, it has examples of the questionnaires and tools. We, it has guides for emergency departments treating musculoskeletal injuries. It has uh, guides for setting up your orthopedic department strategy for that coordinated care uh, and do, doing things in a way that, that patients see as, uh, uh, as collective rather than individual. And it, uh, guidelines for how to safely use and dispose of opioids. To build on this community and organizational approach, we visited Calvert Health in Maryland, in which they have developed prescribing guidelines for clinicians in their organization. Let's take a look. Calvert Health serves the community of Calvert County and all the surrounding counties in Southern Maryland. We had decided to start an opioid task force to deal with some of the issues related to opioids in our community. We were seeing a, a dramatic increase in overdose-related deaths and injuries, as well as narcotic-dependent um, behavior in patients that were coming to the emergency department and the community practices. We want to promote the appropriate use of opioids in our hospital as well as in the community. We wanted to make sure that we were using them safely for our population if we needed to use opioids, and also if we didn't need to use an opioid for a patient, we would use non-opioid alternatives. We came up with guidelines that made sense to our clinicians, and with the guidelines and with education, we found that even before we even implemented the policies, that prescribing was already decreasing. And we've seen a 46% decrease in the number of opioid tablet prescriptions within the emergency department in just a year and a half. We're managing patients' pain, but in a different way. We're using meds synergistically to treat pain, such as using acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, and ibuprofen synergistically together, because by using that combination, it could be just as effective as a Percocet for pain. At times, a patient may have an expectation for an opioid for a particular condition because of practice patterns in the past, but it's important for the clinician to highlight that they will treat their pain with alternatives that will help them, but to also educate them on the potential dangers of opioids. Our Opioid Stewardship Committee had broad multidisciplinary representation from doctors, nurses, allied health, the health department, community practices, and our urgent cares. And having such broad representation gave us the ability to take this beyond the walls of the hospital and to work together on how we can strategize what are going to be some of these best practices to move forward. You can't do this overnight. It's a lot of education. It's partnering with everyone around you and not working yourself. Because if you do something by yourself, and if we just did that in the emergency department and we didn't reach out to our community providers and we didn't reach out to the health department and we didn't reach out to our surgeons, then they wouldn't know what we were trying to do in the hospitals. I think often in healthcare, people are hesitant to start an initiative, fearing that there will be physician resistance, and that's really not the case. Physicians are eager to engage best practices and help move this forward. Our physicians were actually very glad they now finally had some structure and some guidance on how to move forward. 
we believe the utilization of opioid medications and dependence and overdose really belongs along the spectrum of patient safety and to make sure that we are prescribing these medications in the safest, most reliable, scientific way possible. In my heart, I want to see less addiction. I see a lot of families go through pain of having a family member that's addicted. And if we can help decrease that addiction, uh, you know, we've helped a family, we've helped a life. So this is a great video in terms of the community reach, going across the continuum, and establishing guidelines that actually make it easier for physicians to, to have good prescribing habits in. David, your thoughts on this as an orthopedic surgeon? Yeah, I think, of it, I think it's important to think of it as, as strategies or a tool that's, that, that helps the clinician. Uh, you know, they had uh, brochures, they disseminated, they educated everybody. And it, I would take it one step further. Uh, it's, it may be a little uh, hopeful to think that you can teach someone and give them a brochure and they'll be like, okay, this is great. Uh, it's, going to, it's probably going to be a little more nuanced than that. And so expect, attend to the emotional aspect of it and use it as a collectively, this is what we do to keep you comfortable safely. There are there's these upper limits because we collectively have decided that's the safest way to do it. So you take away the individual pressure on you to prescribe more. And Monica, there's a lot of similarities at Calvert in terms of what you've done at Oshner. Can you describe for us why you got started on this path at Oshner? Yes, at, at Oshner we have about 18,000 employees and we're one of the largest healthcare providers for the Gulf South. And we really felt we had a responsibility to make changes um, from our health system to our community. Just last year, the number of deaths due to opioid overdose in East Baton Rouge Parish outnumbered the number of deaths from motor, motor vehicle crashes. In New Orleans, the number of deaths from opioid overdose also outpaced the number of murders. So knowing the severity of the crisis in our own community and uh, understanding the statistics, we have a responsibility to our community to, to make a change and to make a difference and our executives have been very supportive and we have a team of extremely engaged and passionate physicians and nurses and pharmacists and, and our whole team to to make these changes in our community. So working with that team, what have you done? How did you start? Uh, similar to the Calvert Health System, we developed a system opioid stewardship committee. It's an interdisciplinary team, of, again, made up of physicians and nursing, representatives from informatics and regulatory and compliance as well as pharmacists. We uh, looked at our own data and recognized that we had some opportunity in our emergency department to reduce the number of opioid prescriptions that were being written out of our ED. Um, we used this data to provide a peer-to-peer -peer comparison and conduct a, a data transparency pilot at several of our sites. And showing that information to the physicians really drove practice change and they, they just weren't aware. And so, they were very engaged in, in this information and really wanted to, to do the right thing and to change practice. And so we've been very successful um, in that initiative. We also worked with our physician stakeholders in the emergency department to develop best practices to help support them in establishing these practice changes. We have about five work groups in our stewardship committee um, to address the various aspects of the opioid initiatives. It, it couldn't just be one group uh, approaching the acute care setting because this, this uh, issue is so complex that we needed to address areas in the community, in the acute care setting, in our clinics. And so we, we established five work groups to get all of these initiatives done. We've also worked um, tireless, tirelessly with our informatics department to implement changes in our electronic medical record that makes it easier for the provider to, to do the right thing. And then what have you done in terms of actually working with patients themselves in terms of education? Yes, realizing that we uh, needed to um, better manage patient expectations of, of what they the care that they were going to receive in our emergency department, we started with signs that we hung and posters that we hung in our ED that showed them uh, what they could expect. So we weren't necessarily going to turn to uh, parenteral opioids right off the bat. We weren't going to be refilling prescriptions for opioids and we weren't going to be using extended release opioids. 
we were going to be looking at the patient as a whole and establishing a treatment plan that they are a part of so that we can better manage their pain using alternative treatment methods, you know, whether it be pharmacological and NSAIDs, acetaminophen, uh, or, or, or other areas. We then created posters to hang in our primary care department so that when patients are sitting there waiting for their appointment, they can review quick facts about opioids and, and how to use them appropriately because there are patients who they're very effective in. We just need to be more responsible when we use them for these patients and, and helping to educate the patient on how to use them and the risk of using opioids has really helped uh, inform our patients and, and help them become more engaged in their own care. So as you rolled out this organizational approach, what was the reaction from your providers? Our providers have been, um, initially, they were, there was a little resistance in, in worrying about patient satisfaction scores. You know, are we going to um, reduce our patient satisfaction scores if we prescribe less opioids? So we did a, a small study and showed that there was actually no correlation between the patient satisfaction scores and the amount of opioids that were prescribed. And from there, our physicians have been extremely engaged and ex extremely passionate about making changes in our community and, and helping better manage these patients' pain. David, any surprises there for you? No, that fits our experience. We, again, you would think that uh, the worse the fracture you had or the worse surgery you had, the more uh, pain you would have. But what we found in studies of inpatients looking at exactly the amount of, um, of morphine or opioids they took um, was that the more O morphine you took for given, morphine equivalents you took for a given problem, the more pain you had, and the less satisfied you were with your pain relief. So it's more like the opioids were chasing some other issue with pain relief, and it turned out that the most effective pain reliever was a, 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 something you can measure, psychological self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is sort of like, yeah, this is, I just had surgery, it's going to hurt, uh, it's going to be uncomfortable while my body needs some time to heal. And I, I would like to say that I know that the HCAPs, there's been a lot of drive to, to either get rid of those HCAPs uh, pain things or change them, and um, Prescani has changed them so they focus on attention to pain relief, not necessarily success, which I think is good, and I, I think they're going to be not tied to money in the future. But I wouldn't want us to stop asking about comfort. That's one of the most important things we do. But in a lot of ways, there's corollaries here between opioids and, and being asked for opioids for pain relief and antibiotics for otitis media, which we know most of the time is viral in nature and the antibiotics don't help, but physicians feel pressured into complying with patient request. Right, so. and so we've uh, implemented things and uh, tools to support our physicians in, in having those conversations with patients and then changing practice. Um, we've limited our emergency department prescribed supply of opioids to three days in compliance with the CDC guidelines. Uh, and, and that's defaulted in the EMR so that the providers don't have to guess, they know that it's there. Um, we are implementing um, best practices and, and not prescribing if the patient's already receiving opioids. And the provider checks the PMP and then they can see if the patient is already receiving from another physician, they can talk to that other physician and encourage them to, to discuss this with other um, care providers. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we're um, looking at eliminating and reducing the amount of long-acting opioids and, and preferentially turning to morphine if a parenteral opioid is needed rather than um, medications such as Dilaudid. Right, Dilaudid with its longer half-life but also longer onset of action mm -hmm. so people don't get immediate relief and we keep giving more and more and get into that vicious circle. Uh, what about the use of assessment tools in assessing a patient risk in terms of potential for abuse or addiction? Yes, we have a validated screening tool that predicts a patient's risk for opioid dependency or addiction called the opioid risk tool. And any patient who is prescribed an opioid and doesn't already have a risk tool score, it triggers an alert in the health maintenance record. It's a five question tool. Um, it's completed very quickly and it, it can be pre-populated based on information that's already existing in the patient's chart in the EMR. From this tool, it generates a low, moderate, or high risk score. And then we have treatment options built into the EMR based on this score so that providers can easily access the information that they need to, to treat their patients based on their risk level. 
Um, we, we have also discussed with providers, there's sensitive questions on the tool. And initially, there was a little resistance in, in rolling this out. So we realized that and had discussions with providers and helped them have those conversations with the patients. And as Dr. Ring has mentioned, it's, it's important to, to be able to have that communication and that relationship with your patients so that we can have these conversations with them and better treat their pain knowing their history. Are there other innovations that you've rolled out as part of this program? Yes, uh, Asher was one of the first institutions to um, integrate the PMP with our EMR. And so what this does is it pulls the information from the PMP and the providers can use a one-click access to access the, the information that is contained in the PMP to look at the, the patient's opioid history. Then if a prescription is written from the EMR for an opioid, then that information flows back into the PMP so that we have access to the most uh, current and relevant information and we can assess if a patient, how they're being treated outside of our, our own institution. And this has gotten um, very great, we've gotten great feedback on this uh, from our providers and it's previously been a cumbersome process to check the PMP. It was multiple clicks, they had to go outside the EMR, um, go to another website, log in, find that patient. So with this one-click access, it automatically pulls up that patient when they're in that chart in the EMR, and it's expanded our use of the PMP greatly. So we're excited that, we, that we've done that. Uh, we've also built morphine equivalent calculator into the EMR so that when prescriber writes for an opioid prescription, it automatically calculates the number of morphine equivalents that are associated with that prescription. And this helps um, characterize the, the risk level in terms of overdose um, so that when you get to greater than 90 morphine milliequivalents, it, it's an alert to say, you know, maybe this patient, maybe I should be using a lower dose or having a conversation with the patient about the risk of overdose and how to better take the medication. So how have you integrated all this information and innovations into preventing overdoses? Uh, in addition to implementing um, naloxone standing orders in our retail pharmacies, so we have naloxone available without a prescription for patients or, or their family members to purchase, we've also updated our EMR to identify patients that are high risk for overdose. So patients taking a morphine milliequivalents greater than 90 per day, or patients currently prescribed an opioid and a benzodiazepine, or if a patient has a history of substance abuse or opioid dependence, they are at risk for, for overdose at higher risk. And so we want to make sure that we send these patients home with a life-saving medication that could potentially um, save their life with a family member or uh, anyone else around. Great work by your system. Now let's take a look at another institution, Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, Utah. They started their battle against opioid addiction by supporting the community providers. Let's take a look. Currently, there are about 24 deaths per month in Utah associated with prescription opioid overdose. The first step was really putting together the collaborative, identifying partners in the community that would be able to help us with this problem. We wanted to increase awareness of the dangers of prescription opioids. We wanted to change prescribing patterns in the community. We wanted to improve access to treatment. Health systems only serve people who are coming to us at a point of crisis, typically, and we need to be working upstream with community partners who are seeing people at those points in time. The collaboration with Intermountain Healthcare has been terrific. If it hadn't been for them coming forward and saying, we have funds to help get this off the ground, this would have never happened. Intermountain Healthcare has been able to bring $5.5 million to this initiative to fund community partners, to fund the collaboration, and really remove that barrier so that we can be part of the solution. We were able to provide them some grant funding that now subsidizes care for about 342 people who are receiving treatment. These are 350 people who are unfunded and underinsured and never would have been able to pay for the cost of their pharmacy prescriptions. We have great success with those who are receiving medication-assisted treatment and getting talk therapy, which is the treatment as usual in those programs. But it's not just about treatment. It's about public awareness and prescriber education. That's the only way we're going to get to help uh, remedy this problem is through everybody working together. 
Our objective with public awareness was to increase the awareness of the risk of prescription opioids in causing harm and improve awareness around safe disposal. Now all 26 Intermountain pharmacies they have either a drop box or an envelope to collect medications and dispose of them in a secure, safe manner. Internally, it's been a much longer dialogue getting towards an acceptance that we should change our prescribing patterns and that we are, have in fact been part of the problem and need to be part of the solution. We've educated 3,000 of our prescribers in our system, which is more than half of the prescribers in the state. And it has bent the curve in terms of the number of pills they're prescribing by about 10%. We were hoping for something greater. We created a goal that we should decrease by 40%. And I think with that sort of direction and leadership support, people have a lot of energy and motivation now to do something bigger. We have more than 300 people in treatment, and about 91% of those are abstinent from opioids. About 75% are abstinent from all substances. We see people's lives change, their employment situation has improved, their family situation and the dynamics of their family has improved, uh, and making those kind of changes is very rewarding. If Intermountain Healthcare had tried to address this without community partners, we wouldn't be nearly as far as we are. We're having great success in all areas that we're working on, but we still have people dying every month, and we still have new people becoming addicted every day. So the work isn't done, it's, it's really just getting started. So really uh, impactful video in terms of the community reach, the work across the continuum, the cooperation and education needed. Monica, uh, with your experience at the system level, your thoughts on this? Yes, we can certainly echo uh, Intermountain Health's uh, partnerships with other uh, community involvement and other uh, facilities and organizations in approaching this in a multifaceted way. Um, our, our reaction from the providers and our whole system has been extraordinary and we've been able to reduce our prescriptions out of the emergency department by 40%. Um, so we were excited to see the momentum that we have. And taking that momentum, we've now uh, shifted to focusing on alternative um, treatment pathways and pain treatment. We have a Healthy Back program. That's a 10-week program that patients are seeing two times a week. And our patients have reported a 62.5% decrease in pain after just 10 weeks. And so we're really excited about the, the progress that we've made in, in using alternative treatment pathways for these patients. Um, we're also looking at Medicaid grants to provide services that are not usually covered, um, such as paravertebral facet joint blocks. Historically, these patients have really just had opioids as, a, as a, their only option for treatment of pain. And so now we're working with Medicaid to be able to cover these other uh, procedures that can help them. And another um, initiative that we're looking and that we're piloting is that we're excited about is virtual reality. Um, we are using virtual reality to reduce the initial exposure to opioids. And we're piloting this in our pediatrics department for certain procedures and as well as some chemo embolization procedures. So we're excited to see the results of that. We've just started and, and kicked that off. David, your thoughts either from Intermountain's community approach or some of these other innovations that we're hearing about? Yeah, it's, a, it's great to see a, a broader a, approach being taken and, uh, you know, opioids treat pain. They treat physical pain, they treat emotional pain, and I think there ought to be some attention in our communities to the sources of those emotional pains. Often they're in areas where jobs are more difficult to come by and the stresses are higher. and uh, and really take a population level look at how we get people comfortable and, and limit the misuse. Before we go any further, let's get you involved. We're ready for you to join the conversation with us. In Ask a Question window, just type your question or comment and click Submit. We already have quite a few questions, so let's get to it. This is the best part of our show here. Uh, what is your experience with using IV Tylenol? We knew this would come, right? Is it clinically beneficial considering the higher cost? I know this is something we're all facing in our healthcare systems is the use of IV Tylenol. Sure, do you wanna, Go wanna ahead. kick it off? Yeah. Um, I, there are appropriate uh, patients and, and procedures to use IV Tylenol. 
and we have um, incorporated IV Tylenol into our order sets, but we've limited the amount of, of dosing so that we can control the cost because the, the literature, when you look at the literature, there's never a comparison between oral Tylenol and IV Tylenol. So knowing that and looking at our patient population, we've identified specific procedures that it is useful in um, and pre and post-operatively. Um, so we've, we're guiding the use of it through our order sets. Um, and we do have it available and it is appropriate in, in those scenarios, but we are controlling the cost by limiting the amount of doses that patients can get. Yeah, I just, I want to take this question and I want people to think about it, that whenever we say we're going to limit one medication, we ask, we think about what's the next medication. Um, maybe you have a question on there about cannabis. I get that question all the time. And think about that for a minute. It, it's, it belies a passive, powerful other approach to our health. Think for a moment, why does your brain have opioid receptors? Why does it have cannabinoid receptors? Is it, is it just ready for these plants to come along and give us this? No, it's because you make your own opioids. You make your own endorphins and enkephalins. How does somebody in the Netherlands have their ankle fracture fixed and get comfortable on, Tylenol, on, on paracetamol? It's because they have support and meaning and everything that gets their endorphins going and keeps them from having scary thoughts that get out of hand. And so it really should not be about the next medication. So you mentioned order sets, so I, I have to ask this question because we've seen that uh, many times order sets include opioids without any real discretion used in, by the physician. Should opioid ordering be removed from computerized order sets? I think we can, the standardization, so we need a sort of uh, reasonable limit. All the things you talk about, oral morphine equivalents and, and um, having the system say, are you sure, you know, is, this, is this the best amount, and, and some sort of uh, decision, shared helping decision making. Yeah, I think standardization is, is the important part there. Um, opioids are necessary for in our you know, surgical population <coughs> and, and to treat certain types of pain. I, I think we just need to um, look at using our EMR to, to standardize treatment. It, it standard, more standard treatment is safer treatment. Um, and so the more that we can standardize, I think the safer our, our patients will be. Another question from the audience, uh, how are we seeing the opioid epidemic impacting post-acute care? Skilled nursing, long-term care, home health, any workforce considerations that you can think of? Now, what comes to mind for me when I hear that, and I'm not sure I'm capturing the question correctly, but what we do know is that people who take more opioids, for instance, people who come in already taking daily opioids, so they have built up a dependence. Um, take longer to get out of the hospital and are less likely to go directly home. So maybe that's part of what the, the question is getting and at. Maybe it prolongs their length of stay in post It prolongs recovery. It delays recovery. Right. I will say that uh, we had a family member who was in post-acute care, and when she was discharged to come home, we were given 60 uh, Percocet mm -hmm. for, that, for her to bring home, which she never used. Don't call me, don't bug me. <laughs> yeah, right. right. So I mean, uh, you know, you talk about the potential for abuse and yeah. just having pills lying around. And that was, I, I didn't think that was great. Right, and I think that goes back to our, you know, statement of standardization is looking at how many, how many tablets these patients are going home with and seeing if we can cut that down to, to something that's clinically appropriate for that procedure so that they're not going home with 60, they're going home with 20 or 14, you know, whatever yes. is clinically appropriate. But and, and electronic yes. prescribing helps with that. Yes. You right. can give, yeah. give, give, give her five if you think she might need something right. and check with her and call in more if you need to. And then I think establishing referral patterns to, um, to addiction recovery um, programs for patients that have been identified as maybe needing some sort of program and shifting them if they're in that situation, having those referral patterns set up so that uh, providers know where to send their patients if, if they identify that a patient needs help in addiction and recovery. So we have quite a few questions here. I'm gonna combine, I'm gonna take some liberty and combine a couple of them. Uh, what are some of the ways to treat emotional pain 
And then combining that with tapping into patients' emotional aspect of pain perception, what are your successful experiences, if any? Do you have any tangible uh, examples you can share? Yeah, so uh, the, the, you can put it all under an umbrella that has a fancy name called cognitive behavioral therapy, but let's just talk about your mind is a great storyteller. The human mind is a great storyteller. And so you all know if you stub your toe, it, it comes up, I broke it, I'm, I'm gonna need surgery, I, won't, I can't walk, I can't do things I wanna do. And then you kinda take a few steps and the self-efficacy kicks in. It's like, I've done this before, it hurt like hell, but that, this'll be fine. Um, so we need to recognize that, that there are ways to master your stories. And there's many variations on cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's a, it's a matter of learning how to work your mind and it's very effective. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story of a patient who I, I, we recently cared for, and his shoulder was bothering him, and, it, and his, he put, as many of us do, he put all his hope or a lot of his hope on a fix. So he came to a surgeon like me to be fixed, and he had a surgery to be fixed, but guess what? It, 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 the surgery wasn't, it probably didn't address a clear problem. It was more wishful thinking, and then there's a problem with the surgery as well. Well, now that he's with me, I, I've gained his trust, and um, I have that, my social worker who does a little cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, and he's been working with her, uh, seeing her twice a week, and I just got a message from him yesterday about how thankful he is and how much it's helped him. Excellent, that's a great example, thank you. Uh, here's a, a comment slash question. Standardizing treatment does not take into account individual factors. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to hog it, but this is right up, this is the stuff I think about every day. Um, so remember the objective, no susception, pain, all right? So you've got the example of the guy with the broken femur moving himself over in a bed. That's, that's about, that's a pretty impressive thing to do, but we've all seen that. Um, think about the world, the rest of the world, not the United States or Canada, the rest of the world gets that femur fixed, takes morphine for maybe a, a, a half a day and then goes home on paracetamol, which is acetaminophen. Um, so that just shows you that uh, you gotta, you gotta de detach that automatic sense that more pain means more damage. Now, in my world, you would not want to miss a compartment syndrome. You would not want to miss uh, necrotizing fasciitis. So when people are having more pain, you take that seriously, you evaluate that appropriately but you also don't want to miss the diagnosis of symptoms of depression, post-traumatic stress, or ineffective coping strategies. We don't want to miss that diagnosis either. I think we often miss that diagnosis. So this feeds into that. Many of our struggles in dealing with patients who are currently using opioids on a regular basis, so mm -hmm. chronic use, coming in for acute care. Uh, now we don't want to prescribe any more tactics and strategies for dealing or working with these patients. Um, that and that's tough. Um, I think that's when we look towards um, our interdisciplinary team. And first, you have to assess the patient. And I don't know if you have more to add. And in terms of what's causing their pain, why are they on these medications? How long have they been on them? And then moving from there and determining what's appropriate, involving the patient in that decision. What is appropriate for that patient? and that patient's diagnosis. Is it weaning them off the opioids? Is it continuing or is it escalating? I think that's where your, your, yeah. your treatment becomes more individualized um, and helping to, to, to manage them um, more responsibly. What I hear in that question is those of us who are frontline providers and we're being asked for more opioids and we don't think it's a good idea. And it's tempting to reason with people and try to explain, maybe talk about the opioid epidemic. That's, it's not gonna work with everybody. And that's where the strategy comes in. So if you have an organizational collective approach and it's no longer about me, it's not, you know, I'm not gonna get, uh, you know, people have been shot, people have been assaulted uh, because that mean doctor didn't care about my pain. And if we say collectively that we care so much about your pain and your safety in getting comfortable that we've set upper limits on this. And you can even, you can say, 
damn them, damn that, I wish I could give you more, but I can't, I'll get in trouble. I mean, in sticky situations, you can use that. But for me, the thing, I work on a lot of difficult communication, things like not giving antibiotics for a cold or not getting an MRI for back pain or wrist pain when it's not gonna be very useful. Those are very difficult scenarios. I still struggle with those. But the, but the opioids, all I say is, I, I'll get in trouble. We, we can't, we also talk about what we can do for your pain. Well, the other thing I think of here is, and you know, this has been part of your evaluation. You talked about patients, mm -hmm. what are they already on? Are they on chronic opioids now? Let's get them through this next acute phase, but then set the expectation that we're gonna discuss chronic use of opioids with them and look for ways to get them off of that moving forward. So we, we are setting goals for that patient. Yes, we are gonna take care of you now. We are gonna treat your pain, but our goal is ultimately to have you opioid free. You know, yeah. so, so setting that long-term goal and then incorporating the team, whether it's social work, right. other people, to really work with that patient long-term. One thing that's useful that I think some of the viewers will, will resonate with is we have the, the joint replacement bundle. It's the first mm -hmm. uh, CMS bundle, so it's hip and knee arthroplasty. And, and my colleagues in orthopedics who have really had blinders on for, the, for these psychosocial factors are now paying a lot of attention because it, people will say I'm having too much pain or my wound's red and it dings your quality scores, it, it, it hits your reimbursement. And so they screen and treat depression and catastrophic thinking before. And they're even going towards the point that if somebody's been placed on opioids for their arthritis, which is generally people are thinking that's not been a great strategy, not been an effective strategy, they're having them get off the opioids before surgery. So I think that we're really seeing some good developments now that the incentives are aligning. So uh, we have about a minute left. We have more questions than, than we have time. <laughs> and I just want to say to our viewers, we will answer your questions and respond by email or post them on the, the broadcast site. Um, I, I do want to ask this one because I think it's important. Uh, are, are your physicians on board with utilizing order sets versus their favorites in an order to be compliant? Uh, was, was there any pushback? And the other, the other question that's in line with this was, are you using the data and having discussions with physicians that seem to be ordering more opioids than others on the staff? Yes, we, uh, our physicians have really um, gotten engaged in, in using the order sets and um, they do have favorites, but then whenever, when we look at the order sets and revise them and change them, they appreciate the, the time and effort it takes and that we, I think the important thing too is to engage them in the decision. So we don't just make changes based on um, the, what pharmacy looks at the guidelines and makes changes. We engage the entire physician team and physician leaders so that they're involved in the decisions in the order set changes so that they know that their own peers have supported this, this has gotten approval, and we have a formal approval process for any of these changes so they know who has looked at it, reviewed the evidence, and made sure that, that these order sets are in line with best practice and standard of care. Um, the the physicians um, and then what was the because I had a response for the second part of that question but uh, in terms of using the data to identify those who are yes. maybe over prescribing compared to others we've gone to um, we're now going to each service line and showing them their data and showing the physician leaders their data and the physician leaders can then have conversations with the physicians um, that may have a higher prescribing pattern but you also have to look at the data and see it for what it is. It's data. It's non-punitive. It's non-consequential. It's not delivering a message. It's just data. And so where one physician just may see a higher number of patients, then we, um, we have to understand that and, and work with them. But we do use that for conversations with them. Excellent. Thank you both. Great, uh, great Q&A. Great uh, questions from the audience. I, I want to close this program out by saying that last fall, Vizient launched an opioid campaign which is a multifaceted effort to help our member hospitals address this crisis. We realize that while opioids alleviate pain, the misuse of these substances is resulting in unprecedented death and hardship in our communities. By collaborating with our members and industry experts, we believe together we can change the face of opioid addiction for the better in America. As part of that campaign, we have an opioid compendium available on Vizient.com. You will also find past educational programs to help you inform you about the opioid stewardship journey. Finally, in closing, 
David and Monica, thank you very much. Great expertise, great panel discussion. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this program. Uh, if you want to contact David, you can reach him at david.ring at austin.utexas.edu. And if you'd like to reach Monica, her email is monica.morgan at oshner.org. I'd also like to thank Dr. Drew Fuller and Kara Harrier from Calvert Health in Maryland, and Mikhail Moore and Lisa Nichols of Intermountain Healthcare. Finally, Brandon Hatch from the Davis Behavioral Health in Utah for allowing all of, the, all of them for allowing us to interview them for the, interview, or the videos on this program. And thank you for taking time to join us today. Thanks to the Vizzy and Hinn for their ongoing support of this series. If you registered in advance, the program evaluation will be emailed to you. Please take a moment to complete it. Please mark your calendars for the next webcast in this series on Wednesday, March 7, 2018, where we will cover ways to address malnutrition at the organizational level within your communities. And now from Vizient, I'm Dr. Robert Dean. Thanks for watching.